I love my Savior too, and I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on his arm. Rapture will never hear nothing alone. Voices will sweetly blend under his charm. I love my Savior too. And I love my Savior. He loves me too. Humbly now I seek His grace and favor in everything I do. Remain standing. Luke chapter 11. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. The text that was read so wonderfully in your hearing. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Once again, we're thankful to the God of heaven for allowing us to meet one more time on this time side of life. He's good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And once again, we want to congratulate and encourage those veterans who are here tonight. We know that November the 11th is the time we officially celebrate Veterans Day. And we want to thank those men and women who have served and who are serving. And if you're visiting with us tonight, no strangers in the house just friends whom we have not met. Uh, we want to deal with this phrase, our Father, which art in heaven. On last Sunday night, we dealt with the first two words in this phrase, our Father. Those two words speak about relationship. They indicate that the individuals who pray this prayer are able to pray this prayer because they have a relationship with God. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray like you pray. And this is part two in that particular installment that is here at Dale Crest so we can learn how to pray like Jesus taught his disciples to pray. This prayer is not the prayer we are to pray with repetition. But rather, this prayer is a pattern. It is a template that teaches us how to have a powerful prayer life. And when you pray, the first thing you should always pray in every prayer is, you should give reverence to God as being your father. 
you should exalt him because all of our blessings come from God the Father. It is through our Lord and Savior and eldest brother Jesus Christ that we can even approach the very throne of God the Father. Do you not know we do not pray to Jesus, but we pray through Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the one who endorses our checks before they are cashed in heaven's bank. And if Jesus does not endorse your prayer, then God will not hear your prayers. And we need to understand something that if we have a relationship with God the Father through knowing that God will hear our prayers. 1 John chapter 3 and about verses 1 and 2, John said, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Do you understand the privilege that you have if you are a baptized believer? You have the privilege of approaching your Father, that is God, in prayer no matter where you are and when you talk to the Father, he'll listen to your prayer. And as I told the Bible class on Wednesday morning during our prayer meeting, God either answers your prayer yes, because he knows that what you're asking for, you are ready for it, and it is ready for you. Then sometimes he says no, because what you're asking for, either you are not ready for it, or it's not ready for you, or if the Lord were to give it to you, it would cause you to turn your back on serving him. And then sometimes God says, wait. Because sometimes what you're asking for, you're not mature enough to handle. And so God has to wait until he can mature you before he can give you what you're asking for. But every prayer that you ever utter, if you're a child of God, he answers every prayer. You might not like the answer that you get from God because God doesn't always say what you want him to say. And sometimes when God says no, we think he's saying wait, when in actuality he's saying no. I mean, there are things that my children have asked me for in the past when they were little, and I simply said no. And when I said no, I meant what I said. But you know, if a child asks 18 years old, then you know they need a bicycle, not a tricycle. And if a two-year-old asks you for a bike, they don't need a bike, they need a tricycle. And when they get to be uh, in that intermediate age, you might get them a bike but you want to make sure it has some safety wheels on it until they learn how to ride the bike for themselves. Sometimes we're asking God for a bicycle when spiritually speaking we're only two years old and God said you're not ready for a bicycle so I give you a tricycle and if you try that sickle long enough and learn how to deal with that it won't be too long before you graduate to a bicycle. And so we need to understand something. God knows what we need better than we know for ourselves. Sometimes we're asking God for a relationship. And God will mingle and you want somebody to give you a jingle, but you ain't ready for marriage. You got to learn how to be faithful to me because I'm your spiritual husband. And if you can't be faithful to God the Father, who is your spiritual husband, how are you going to be faithful to a man or to a woman who becomes your spouse? If you can't be faithful to your spiritual spouse, how are you going to learn to be faithful to your human spouse? And sometimes, if God put us in a relationship, we get married and some of the women will be in church and won't even hear what the preacher is saying because they're too busy playing with their husband mustache. And then sometimes, fellas, he'll give you the woman of your dream and you'll get so caught up in her that you forget about serving God. God gives you what you need when you can handle it in your life. But he only hear your prayers if you are his child and he is your father. But not only does these words speak about relationship, but then the next two words speak about reality. 
He says, our father, which art. Y'all just missed your shout. Which art? Those two words indicate that our God is not some kind of fantasy. He's not like Santa Claus. He's not like the Easter Bunny. He's not like some kind of Jedi Star Wars figure. Our God is. Our God is a reality. Sometimes we treat God like he is some kind of fantasy. But our God, he is real. Our God, he is alive. And Jesus says, when you relationship with God, but you pray because God is real. Amen. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. He told Moses over there in Exodus chapter 3. When Moses was commissioned by God. And Moses was to go to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. When the Lord commissioned him, Moses said, Lord, who am I going to say sent me? And the Lord said, when you go down to Egypt to the place where they have gods but they don't exist they have gods they have names and those gods do not even live when you get down to Egypt you tell them I am that I am those four consonants make up the holy name of God and what they mean is God will be whatever you need him to be if you need a mother he says I am if you need a husband I am if you need a wife I am if you need a counselor I am whatever you need God said out all by myself I am not some kind of fantasy I am a reality I am God and I exist and when you go to God in prayer you must believe that God is that when you talk to God in prayer you need to visualize the Father in heaven listening to your prayers. And how many times do we go to God in prayer and we act like our prayers are not going to be answered even before we utter them? You must believe that not only do you have a relationship with him so you can say our Father, but then you need to believe in the reality of his existence. One day the scientists got together and they said, we don't need God anymore. We got technology and, and we, can, we can make man in a test tube and we don't need God anymore. God, we don't need you anymore. And so God got in a conversation with the scientists and they said, God, we can make man all by ourselves. God said, okay, let's see you make man by yourself. And then God took the dust from the ground breathe into his nostril and soul and then he waited on the scientist and the scientist said okay we can do that and the scientist went to get some dirt and God said hold on you got to make your own dirt God is God exists God is a reality so when you pray you say our father which art watch this the next word in heaven our father resides in that place that is called heaven when Jesus died on Calvary's cross got up three days later had a 40 day meeting with his disciples he stepped on a cloud and the angel saw him going up to heaven and he told the disciples he's coming back in the same way that he left and when he got to glory he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and now he's making intercessions where is he in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God when we pray we need to point our prayers towards heaven and Jesus said in John 14 to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you will be also where did he go church he went to heaven so when we pray 
we are pointing and directing our prayers to that place where God resides. Now we know God is in all places at all time and at the same time. But Jesus said, when you pray, you pray our Father which art where? In heaven. That holy place. That place where God is revered. That place that is sinless. That place where there is no crime. That place where there is no lying, no dying, no sickness. That place where God resides. When we pray, we should learn heavenwardly. And then finally, not only do these words speak about relationship, our Father, reality, which art, and the realization of heaven, but then finally, they speak about responsibility. Let me go back to the first two words. He says, our Father. Y'all miss your shout. Our Father. First person plural. Not first person singular. Not just my Father. But he said, our Father. See, sometimes we act like God is just my Father alone. When we get up and pray, we need to realize that we are a spiritual family. And when I'm lifting up my family, I don't want to stand behind this holy desk and just pray for my personal desires. That's why we lift up the desires of this entire family of God. Galatians one another's burdens. It's not just my responsibility to bear some of my burdens on my own, but sometimes I need to help my brothers, I need to help my sister bear their burdens. Philippians chapter 2 and about verse 4, the Bible says, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. This is a corporate relationship. We're not in this thing by ourselves. We cannot segregate and separate and alienate ourselves one from the other because if one hurt, we should all hurt. If one rejoice, we should all all rejoice and when we approach the throne of God we should never approach his throne just asking God to help us alone when we approach the throne of God Jesus said you ought to approach it with an our father and not just my father the story is told about in Roman, Roman mythology and Roman law, they had, was in his tent. No one could disturb him. And if you disturb the emperor with any request while he was in his tent, you would be put to death. And one day, a soldier, he had a petition that he wanted to bring to the emperor. And the centurions that were guarding the emperor's tent stopped him. And they said, you're going to be put to death because you know you're not even supposed to come into any proximity of the emperor's tent. And as a result of Roman law, we're going to kill you. And all while this was all unfolding outside the emperor's tent and back and forth. And the soldier was saying, please, I, I know I need to be put to death. I, I know I'm going to die, but before I die, can you at least let me petition the emperor with my request before I die. And the emperor, having mercy in his heart, said, let him come, let him come. And if his request is unjust, I want you to kill him on the spot. Then the soldier began to pour out his heart and he said, my Lord, as he bowed before him, I do not approach you with this request for myself, but two of your soldiers, my fellow comrades, have been taken by the enemy 
And the only reason I'm approaching you, sir, is to ask if you will assist us in bringing them back and bringing to... And then the emperor immediately said, take your hands off of him. Do not hurt him anymore. And they said, sir, we're sorry, but why? Roman law says we are to kill him if he approach your presence without your permission. He said, the reason we are going to spare him is because this man did not selfishly approach me with a request for himself, but we are going to spare his life because the request was made for somebody else. God will more often and more likely hear our prayer concern about others and not just ourselves so he said when you pray you need to pray our father who did you pray for when you prayed last was it just a prayer for yourself and I'm not saying there are times when you need to pray for yourself but pray for yourself only in this sense Father forgive me for my sins that as I approach your throne of grace please forgive me that whatever sins have been in my life will you please remove them so they won't stand between you and me now Lord I'm lifting up Dale Chris I'm lifting up your elders I'm lifting up your deacons I'm lifting up your preacher I'm lifting up your children. Is that what you pray? Or do you pray, Lord, give me the house. Lord, me the relationship. And I'm not saying there's not time for those kinds of prayers. But Jesus said, you better pray our Father. That's relationship, which art. Because God is real in heaven because that's the realization and then he says finally pray with responsibility don't just pray for yourself but pray for somebody else Lord teach us how to pray part two pray with me Father we come in your presence lifting up their crest Asking dear God that whatever sins are in my life, forgive me that as I exalt you as being our father, we thank you that we have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have a down payment on our inheritance being the end of your church, which is our shelter on earth in the time of storm. We thank you for your word, which has become the GPS, the navigational system that directs us from earth to glory. And now, Lord, bless Dale Chris. Bless your congregation. Bless your shepherds. Bless your deacons who serve. Bless me as your man of God that I might proclaim your word. Bless the saints that make up this church, this congregation, that we will exalt you, that we will edify one another, and we will evangelize our friends, our families, and those in our social circles, and those that we come in contact with, that we might do it for your glory, for your honor, so that you might receive the praise that you would do because you are God all by yourself. Bless us now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And tonight, if you want to know him as your father, I plead with you, come by faith. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Come repenting of anything in your life that puts you at a guilty distance with God. I don't care what it is. Repent of it. And if you need to accept him as your savior, 
confess him, his son, to be his son. And we'll baptize you tonight. You, experience, you will experience that new birth of water and of the spirit. And when you come up out of that water, having been washed of all your sins by the blood of Jesus, having received the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, being added to the church of Christ and your name is written in heaven, when you come up out of that water, you'll be a new creature in Christ and then you can pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. And if you're a child of God and you just need prayer tonight, we want to give you an opportunity to come as together we stand and as we're led in song. I am resolved no longer to trust in Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my son. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Glad to see everyone uh, who is present uh, on this evening. We want to uh, recognize those who have. Sister uh, Carrie Raglan, who's the, the uh, granddaughter of uh, Harold Holmes Sr. and the daughter of Harold Holmes Jr. Uh, she's praying for traveling uh, mercy and for God's peace in her.